Amen. So you look at what's going on today and sovereignty. Sovereignty is what I believe we have to continue to rehearse. God is sovereign and God is sovereign and God is love. And no matter where you are, no matter what place you find yourself, no matter what stronghold you're wrestling with, no matter what's before you, no matter what you're dealing with at home or with the job or health or whatever, God is sovereign. And the sovereign one loves you with an everlasting love. You are the apple of his eye. And it's important as we're living in this day. Remember, 2 Timothy chapter 3 said that these days will be perilous. Perilous, it means hard to bear. The scriptures told us beforehand that we would be in these days, they would be hard to bear. Paul came in and told Timothy that these days would be characterized by seducing spirits. And in our minds, we always think, well, seducing must be just only in the category of lust issues. No, just being seduced into impotence, being seduced into inactivity, being seduced into just a privatized Bible memorizing Christianity uh, without the gospel being, you know, your lingua franca to a lost and dying world. Just being seduced in so many ways, just being seduced into the world, being seduced into just working on your own little personal comforts, being seduced into just making sure your kingdom is safe, you know, as the whole world's falling to pieces and forgetting the things of the kingdom of God. The scripture says so much about these days. And while the media is driven by fear and driven by reactions and, you know, we just have to remember that God is God and we have to rehearse that. And I'd encourage you to Start having your own personal Bible studies and just finding verses on the sovereignty of God. I have to remind myself regularly that a bird cannot fall to the ground without my father say so. Matthew 10. I have to remind myself regularly that Nahum chapter 1 says that the Lord has his way even in the tornado. God is still sovereign, which means every projectile just in the midst of just the darkest tornado, he still is having his perfect way. He even is sovereign over every projectile. He's sovereign over every meteor. He's sovereign over everything. He's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Our days are numbered. Our days are in his hand. Nothing can move us until he calls us home. We're seated in heavenly places with Christ. Sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. And that's just what's on my mind. So Many times when I'm going to the Word, I'm just going to just rehearse the sovereignty of my Lord. It says basically in Isaiah 40 that, that the nations of the earth are like, are like the dust in the balance. You're like, the dust in the balance, what does that mean? Well, in biblical times, you would not use an electronic digital scale if you were in the market or, you know, the, 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 the thoroughfare. You know, basically there were a set of scales. And when the vendor wanted to show you that he was a just man or she a just woman, what she would do is just blow on the scales before weighing your price. Product, and even though she didn't see any dust, it was her way of saying or his way of saying, I'm so into you getting your fair share that I'm even blowing anything that's microscopic off. That's what it means in Isaiah 40 when it says that basically the nations are like the dust in the balance. God is so sovereign that even the mightiest, most boastful nation is just like the dust that the vendor blows off their scale. Wow. But we have to believe that. We have to celebrate that. That has to still get us excited in a day where the world is just being governed by a spirit of fear and so much of the church right now is being governed by a spirit of fear. We have to celebrate that. So there's a few points I'd like to make today and you could just write them down. We're going to keep it simple though we're going to journey through a lot of scripture. One, God is for you. And the God who is for you loves you with an everlasting love. God is for you, and the God who is for you loves you with an everlasting love. Two, God is in control of everything pertaining to your life. Everything pertaining to your life, God is in control. Your greatest victories, 
your deepest, darkest struggles, everything pertaining to you, God is in complete control, even what he is not the author of, right? James comes in and even tells us, hey, when it comes to the category of temptation, when you're going through your temptations, even though trials can be from God, temptations is what comes from just the wickedness of your own heart. But the point is God is even in control even over that. So point one, God is sovereign, God is for you, and he loves you. Two, God is in complete control over your life. Three, God is not through with you. God is not through with you. So let's begin reading and let's unpack this. And first, let's start with Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 31. Paul jumps in and he says, what shall we say then to these things? And he's basically just really unpacking verse 30, where it says, moreover, whom he did predestinate to be his, he also divinely summoned, that's the moment where we gave our lives to the Lord, whom he divinely summoned or called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Glorification refers to when we are taken from earth and we are in glory in our new bodies with the Lord forever. But do you notice here that glorified is in the past tense? You would think it would say, whom he justified, them he will glorify, them he will one day glorify. But you see what it says? It says that we're already glorified. You see, the Lord sees it as already a done deal. He already knows when each of us will go home. He already has our names in the book of life. He already has our spot on the Father's throne, seated with him as he promises in Revelation. That's why it's in the past tense. It's as good as done. When he sees us, he already sees us with him mission accomplished, singing the worship song to the Lamb, already seated and clothed in righteousness. We're already glorified in His sight. It's already done. It's past tense. Then Paul comes in in verse 31 and says, in light of all of this, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, verse 32, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not now with him freely give us all things? Verse 33, who will lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who can condemn you? The devil can't. And 1 John 3.20 says, even when your own heart tries to condemn you, it says God's greater than your heart, meaning God has the final say, not even your own heart. When your heart thinks that you, because you know your own personal diary so well, your heart feels like it has the right to condemn you. It says God is even greater than your heart, even your own heart that knows everything and the things no one else knows. Even your own heart doesn't have the right to condemn you anymore when you belong to Jesus. Who is he that condemneth? You can't even condemn yourself. Why? Because it is God who justifies. Justified means just as if I never sinned. When you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, hallelujah to the gospel, the Lord at that moment sees you as justified, acquitted, not guilty. You're given the righteousness of Christ. The negative overdrawn balance of your sin is deleted and the positive surplus righteous balance of Jesus's perfect life on earth is credited to your account. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He sees you as righteous. He sees you as justified, justified, a.k.a. just as if I never sinned. So who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Verse 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Hebrews 7, 25, two verses in Scripture that lets us know that not only is Christ on the right hand of the Father, speaking of a finished work, right? But he's also praying for us even now. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And what it means is the love of Christ in action, not just him upon the throne looking down and saying, oh, how I love him. Oh, how I love her. Oh, how I love them. But it's a love in action. Who can separate us from the love of Christ in action? Shall tribulation? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Sword? No. And then here's a, a verse that we have to unpack the context. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That actually... And you know that that's not true because some believers will just read it and say, oh, I'm just continuing to read. Yes, 
We are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But look at what Paul does. He comes in in verse 37 and says, no. What he's doing is he's quoting from the Psalms when the Israelites were going through a valley and they were thinking wrongly and the Israelites were acting though God's forsaken us, we're killed all day long, we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. He's quoting a Psalm of when they were thinking wrongly. He's saying, look, nothing can separate us from his love. We are not accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Beware of that non-biblical thinking. That's why in verse 37, he says, nay, never, nada, not true, perish the thought in all these things. In all what things? In all types of peril, in all types of sword, in all types of nakedness and hunger and not having needs at time, in all types of famine, in all types of persecution, in all types of spiritual warfare, in all types of distress, in all types of tribulation. Those things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? To be more than a conqueror means a conqueror is a conqueror after they win the battle. More than a conqueror is you've already won before you even put your shoes on in the morning. Man, we got to let this really rock us. We really have got to let this. Do you know Romans 8 is the most read chapter? They found the most read chapter, especially among Christians going through persecution in restricted nations, you know, going through just the unimaginable this is the most read chapter in the world. For I am persuaded, verse 38, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers, that refers to spiritual wickedness, nor things happening right now, nor whatever's going to happen tomorrow, things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's go to Ephesians 3. Now do you see why Paul, when he could pray no greater prayer for the Ephesians. He prayed that they would just know how much they were loved. I want to share this with you, brothers and sisters. The believers who are going to be used mightily, the believers who are going to stand the strongest in these days, the believers who are going to walk in Daniel 11:32, it says, but the wicked will do more wicked, but the people who know their God, and in the Hebrew, it means those that know him experientially, those that know him, not just those who are born again, because you can be born again, be in relationship with him, but not go deeper. You just want the relation to stay shallow. No, it says the people that want to go deep with their God, the people that know him experientially, the people that cry out and say, I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I want to know you more. It says those people, Daniel eleven thirty two, 32, will be strong and do exploits. To know the Lord experientially more is to know his love more. Because 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. The people who are going to last in these these days, the people who are going to stand strong in these days, the people who are going to maintain their distinction in these days, the people who are going to be salty in these days, the people who are going to be light in these days are going to be the people who know and who are rocked by the reality of how much God loves them. We have got to get to know and celebrate how much he loves us. We have got, we have got to make it our mission to know this love. This is why this is what Paul prayed. In Ephesians chapter 3, he said this. For this cause, Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Holy Spirit in your inner man. So that this, he says, I'm praying that you would be filled and rocked with the Holy Spirit, right? And he says, so that this would happen, so that this would happen, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in what? In love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. What did you say in verse 19? To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. To know the love of Jesus that passes merely just memorizing verses about it. To know that love. 
And then what does he say? So that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. What did he just say? He said, you walking in the fullness of all of what God has for your life, you walking in the boldness, the confidence, the power, the celebration, and that no matter what bad week you may have or what bad day you may have, you continue to celebrate that love. That comes as a function of knowing how much you're loved by him. Again, I don't want to do any eisegesis here where I'm putting in the scriptures what I wanted to say. Exegesis is what I'm after. The word says it. He says that you would know, verse 19, the love of Christ that passes just intellectual calisthenics so that you what? Might be filled with the fullness of God. You walking in your fullness is a direct function of you knowing and celebrating and experiencing this love of Christ, Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from. Who's with me? Who's with us? Who's down for this? Who is, who's open for that? Do you leave yourself open? Oh, we're always like, oh yeah, the devil will try to talk to you. Oh, beware of night terrors. Oh, beware of, you know, demonic dreams at night. Devil, 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 devil. Let's talk about what God might do while you're asleep. Are you open to the sweet influences of God while you're sleeping? Do you ever go to sleep and say, God, I give you the right to speak to me? Just, you may wake up and not even know what you dreamt, but you know that you just slept under some sweet influences of God. Are you ready or is it always about, well, don't, don't, be, don't open yourself up. You know, the devil comes in. Don't open yourself up. The flesh comes in. Don't open yourself up. You start having weird dreams. No, are you just open? Are you open for God to be sovereign? And are you open to know every day and every minute to just see evidence that he loves you? just to see evidence that he's there? Or are you still at the place where you think the only time God can communicate his love to you is when you're actually in front of your Bible having Bible study? No, no, having Bible study is what helps you to exercise and discern what God's doing as you walk around in the world, but every moment, are you open for his sweet influences? Christ is God, Christ loves us. Let's go to Numbers now, let's go to Numbers 22. Let's go to Numbers 22. We're going to talk about a man named Balaam. We're going to talk about a warlock named Balaam. And you know what? Can I, uh, can I redo those three points? I want to redo them, please. And I'm going to write it down up here, too, because I'm having a good time. One, we want to say that God is sovereign. God loves you. And God is for you. All right, and we're going to write down Romans 8, and we're going to write down Ephesians 3, and we're going to write Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. God is sovereign, God loves you, and God is for you. Now, we're going to go to point two, and we're, we're redoing it. Two, God wants to use you mightily. That's what we're going to say. God wants to use you mightily. All right, you ready? We're going to work, or I'll let you know what point three is going to be in a minute. But for right now, that's what we're going to stick at. We're going to stick right here at, 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 now you know what? God is sovereign. God loves you. God is for you. God wants to use you mightily. Point two, God, oh, God is sovereign. Yeah. Let's just read, all right? Let's do this. We're going to look at a warlock by the name of Balaam, right? One thing we do have clear in the word of God is just established. One, God is sovereign. Two, the Lord is for you and the Lord loves you. We're going to look at the story of a man named Balaam. Balaam, I don't know if you know who he is, but Balaam is a warlock. Balaam is a witch. Balaam is a soothsayer, all right? Based on scripture, Balaam, witches, warlocks, Satanists, were to be killed uh, because they entertained demonic spirits, knew they entertained demonic spirits, uh, and used that as an influence to go directly against God, right? Uh, it is a blatant way of just saying, I side with the one who rebelled against God in heaven, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. So Exodus 22, 18, and Leviticus 20, verse 27, it was a capital punishment, right? But what we're going to see is we're going to watch God use even a warlock mightily. And that's why I'm wrestling with the points because however I lay them out, just embedded in all the points today is going to be God's sovereignty. Why don't you figure out your own three points? What's going to be embedded through all of it is going to be his sovereignty. It's going to be his love for you. And it's going to be that he wants to use you mightily. So it's going to come in a bunch. But look, how many of you know the story of Balaam? Do you know the story of Balaam? Again, 
For every New Testament principle, there's Old Testament pictures. We looked at the New Testament principles of his love. We looked at New Testament principles of his sovereignty, right? We looked at how nothing could separate us from his love in action. Now we're going to look at a picture where there's Balaam. Balaam was from Mesopotamia, okay? He was from Mesopotamia. He basically was from where Abraham was from when Abraham was a demon worshiper before God called him in Genesis 12. You will find that in Numbers 23, verse 7. In Numbers 23, verse 7, it says, Balaam says that he was brought from Aram. Aram is another way of saying Mesopotamia. So we know he's a warlock right? And you'll find that in Joshua chapter 13, verse 22. We let scripture unpack scripture. Joshua 13, 22 tells us he was a soothsayer. He was a warlock. We see through the story him being uh, his, his work in action, but Joshua 13, 22, he was a soothsayer, warlock, spiritist, medium, Satanist, demon worshiper, okay? In Joshua chapter 23, I'm sorry, Numbers 23, verse 7, he's from Mesopotamia. That will explain why, even though he is a blatant Satanist, a blatant warlock, why he has this knowledge of the true and living God. What that means is that when Abraham walked away from Mesopotamia and had that vision of God in Genesis 12, and he went from worshiping the moon God and all the other gods and began walking with the true and living God, it means, one, Abraham obviously was a man of considerable wealth. Mesopotamia was a flourishing city. It means when he left, he left evangelistically and people knew about the true and living God through his life. That's the only way to explain why down the road we see a soothsayer from Mesopotamia who has this knowledge of the true and living God. Let's keep reading. So anyway, here's the story. The Israelites have just taken over and wiped out a nation, and there's many more nations to come. One, all of the then known world heard what God did in Egypt and how the Lord took the number one superpower in the world and flipped it upside down just to redeem his people from there. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8, right? Everyone knew that. There is a king of Moab. His name was Balak, right? His name was Balak. He knew the Israelites were coming, and like a steamroller, he knew that his nation did not stand a chance because all the Canaanite nations that fought against the Israelites were getting wiped out. So what does he do? He goes and he hires a warlock by the name of Balaam. He hires this warlock by the name of Balaam and basically says, I'm going to pay you I'm going to pay you, and this all takes place in Numbers chapter 22. I'm going to pay you to curse the people of God because look at Numbers 22 verse 6. Look at the end. He says, I know whoever you bless, you mighty witch, you mighty warlock, you mighty Satanist, whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. One thing everyone knew about Balaam is when he opened his mouth, if he cursed you, it stuck. You were cursed. There was no matter of, well, let's wait a week. Well, it's been two weeks. It's been three weeks. What if Balaam's curse didn't work? Balak says, I'm picking you because you're the best. This people, the Israelites, are coming. I stand not a chance against them, but I know that I can hire you to curse them. And if you curse them, it'll stick like glue, right? Basically, the Lord appears to this warlock. The Lord appears to this warlock, and first the Lord says, because Balak sends messengers to Balaam in Numbers 22, and he gives him riches, and he offers him all of this. He sends all this prestigious, you know, entourage, and says, basically, I will promote you if you do this, right? Basically, if you look at Numbers 22, verse 7, it says the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with, look what it calls it, the rewards of divination, right? We're going to load you down. Anyway, God shows up to Balaam. He shows up to this warlock. That's why, again, the points run all through it. In this story, we're going to continue to see God's sovereignty. We're going to continue to see God's love. And then we're going to move to the last one, which is God wanted to use us mightily, right? The Lord appears to Balaam. And says, basically, don't go with them. Do not curse the people because they are blessed. Look at Numbers 22, verse 12. God appears to Balaam 
it must have been Abraham's influence why this warlock recognizes the true and living God. There's no, well, who are you? How'd you show up? Again, we just see in the word in Numbers 23, verse 7, he was from Aram. He was from Mesopotamia. He's from the very place where Abraham left. And no doubt when Abraham left, he told people, I'm following the true and living God, right? So God appears to Balaam and says, do not go with them. Do not go with Balak to curse the people he's trying to hire you to curse because they're a blessed people. Again, Romans 8 runs all the way through this. You know, who can condemn us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can come against us? If God is for you, who can be against you, right? So, verse 15, Balak sent more princes and more money, and he sent more prestigious people to continue to go to Balaam, right? Verse 10, or verse 16, they came to Balaam and they said to him, thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing hinder you from coming to me because I will promote you to very great honor and I will do whatever you say. It's basically like when Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness, he's basically saying, there's nothing you'll want if you let nothing. He's basically, Balak has no regard for the true and living God. He's like, God, nothing. Let nothing keep you from coming to do this, right? Well, now you see Balaam starting to buckle, right? Because in verse 19, he, now he says to the people something different. The first time he says, basically, I can't go with you, right? So in verse 13, he says, go back to the land because the Lord refuses to let me go with you. Then you get it. Balak sends back more money, more rich people, right? Now, all of a sudden, this is what Balaam the warlock says. Verse 19, now, therefore, I pray you, tarry, why don't you stay the night? Let me go and see what the Lord will say unto me more. Well, one, there's nothing to pray about. You know, when you want to do that compromise, you know, all, everything's in the name of let me pray again. He already knew the answer, but now he's being worn down. Do you know, interestingly, Balaam is mentioned at least three times in the New Testament. And I love how when Jesus even walked among us, he made a point of affirming the stories that we may find the most difficult to wrap our minds around. Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. Jesus came and verified that as historical fact. Jonah, Jesus came and verified that as a historical fact. Noah and the flood, Jesus came and verified that as a historical fact. Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus came and verified that as a historical fact. It's amazing that the New Testament, three times at least, Balaam is mentioned in the New Testament as a real historical person, but we know that already because it's the word of God. So he continues to be entertained. He gets up in the morning and he goes with them. If you know the story, basically he's riding a donkey and basically God comes down as an angel of the Lord stands in the way of him going. The donkey sees the angel of the Lord. Balaam doesn't. Three times Balaam's hitting the donkey. The donkey now speaks and rebukes him. And again, remember, if you believe Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, you could believe any story in the Bible, right? If you have no problem believing that God created everything with his word alone, uh, then you have no problem believing if a donkey speaks and rebukes someone, right? Verse 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, what have I done unto you that you have smitten me these three times? Now he is being rebuked even by the donkey, right? If you look at Numbers 22, verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. He now finally sees this angel of the Lord standing in the way. He sees a sword drawn in his hand. He bows his head and he falls flat to his face. And the angel of the Lord, verse 32, says to him, why have you smitten your donkey these three times? I went out to withstand you because your way is perverse before me. Now you have the Lord appearing to Balaam and saying, I told you not to go. Then you're offered more money, so you decide you will go on this journey to curse my people who are blessed. I came out to withstand you because your way is perverse before me, right? Basically, verse 34, Balaam says to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I knew not that you stood in the way over against me. And verse 35, the angel of the Lord says to Balaam, go with the men now. But only say the word that I speak to you. That's what you're going to speak. So Balaam went to be with the Lord. So what you clearly see here is God's way. God is telling him, your way is perverse before me. 
right? This is a warlock who should have been killed by Old Testament economy, right? Look at what God is doing here. There's so much going on, right? Now he says, your way's perverse before me, so I'm hindering you, but now I'm gonna permit you to go, but you only say what I tell you to say when you go there. Meanwhile, Balak, the king who's hiring him to curse God's people has no idea this is happening, right? Balaam, verse 38, appears to Balak and says, lo, I'm come to you. I do not have any power to say anything. The word that God puts in my mouth, that's what I'm going to speak. Balak is still like, yeah, whatever. But Balaam has now said to him, I'm, I'm only going to say what God tells me to say, right? So verse 41, it came to pass in the morning that Balak, the king of Moab, took Balaam the warlock, brought him to the high places of Baal. That was the chief demonic deity. Uh, the worship revolved around sexual orgies and nature worship. And they would worship on the highest places because they believed that that got you the closest to the heavens. So Balak takes Balaam up to one of these pagan places. The place was probably just riddled with just all types of stuff and human blood from the cuttings they would do. Remember the days of Elijah? He takes them to this grotesque place where they believe that that's how they got their power, right? So basically, he takes him up there so that he might see. And look at this. He takes him up there. Please zero in now because this is when the story starts getting even more glorious. He takes him up there that he might see the utmost part of the people. Balak takes him up to a mountain so that he could see every, the, the most advantageous spot to be able to see all of the Israelite camp. You see, the word says that. He took him up there so he might see the utmost part of the people. Numbers 22, 22, right? But here's the thing. Would you please, just on your own time, would you read Numbers chapter 1? You see, in Numbers chapter 1, it basically spells out when the Israelites traveled, and there are roughly 2 million Israelites on this journey. We know that because even in Numbers 11, Moses is going to say, Lord, I have 600,000 footmen. So we knew there were 600,000 men who were soldiers alone. You start adding in the women and the kids, there's roughly 2 to 3 million Israelites traveling through the wilderness. Now, when the cloud stopped, they stopped. When the pillar of fire stopped, they stopped. When the cloud abode, they pitched a camp. But it wasn't a matter of me, you know, and Pastor Sherman, you know, and Brother Ray's, you know, just deciding, well, we're going to just sleep over here because we're having a good conversation. And, and you know, over there is the worship team. No, no. You were to camp according to your tribe. Numbers chapter 1 lays out which tribes camp to the east of the tabernacle, which camps uh, camp to the west, which ones to the north, and which ones to the south. Here's the thing. If you add up the numbers... And it tells you in Numbers 1 the numbers. Check this out. Check this out. Matter of fact, let me just read real quick and come back. In Numbers 23, it says this. Balaam looks over all of the camp. And check this out. Hold on. We're going to come back to Numbers 1 in a minute. In Numbers 23, here's Balaam looking out over all of the Israelites. Numbers 22, 22 just told us he sees the utmost parts of the camp. No part of the camp was around a little hill over there. He sees it all, right? And this is what he says. He says this, Numbers 23, verse 8. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied, right? And then he says this. Who can count the dust of Jacob, verse 10, and number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Basically, look at verse 9. From the top of the rocks I see him, from the hills I behold him. Lo, this people will dwell alone, meaning they are separate. They are the apple of God's eye. They will dwell alone and they will not be reckoned among the nations. If you see Numbers 23, 8, 9, and 10, do you see what he's saying? He's seeing something so amazing that he says, I want to die like them. I want to finish like them. They are separate from all the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? If you look at Numbers 21 again, it wasn't a matter of you sleeping with your BFFs and you sleeping with this group. Each camp was told where to pitch. Check this out. The three tribes that pitched to the east, 
numbered 186,400. The three camps that pitched to the west are 108,100. The three camps that pitched to the south were 151,400. The three camps that pitched to the north were 157,000. And you find that in Numbers chapter 1. When he's standing looking at the 12 tribes of Israel camped around the Levites in the tabernacle, if you look at these numbers, you get it? The east was the longest. The west was the shortest. The north and the south were basically the same. The people of Israel, when they camped, was in the form of a cross. When they camped, when they camped for the night, when you stood and saw them, when the father looks down, and now that Balaam's on this pagan mountain, what he's really seeing is he's seeing things from God's vantage point. He goes from being this warlock on the horizontal level who, who I curse stays cursed, who I bless stays blessed. He now has already seen a vision of God. He now is seeing how God's people look when you look at them from on high, how life looks when you look at life from on high, how everything looks from heaven's vantage point. He's now realizing if you're among the Israelites, you just see a lot of people everywhere. If you're among the Israelites, you just know that tribes are this way and tribes are that way. But to see things from on high, you now see what God sees. Our calling, brothers and sisters, is to see the world we're living in now, to see our own life, to see everything from how God sees it. To come on high is to see more than just, oh, that's church. Oh, well, that's the assembly of the righteous. It is to see a cross. He sees a cross. Well, you check it out for yourself. Numbers chapter one, when the Israelites camped, when the Israelites camped every time, not just on one lucky day, not just on a day when, you know, the, no, no, every time they camped and were instructed. Now, remember, if one tribe veers off this way, you're no longer south of the tabernacle. You're southeast or you're south, you're northeast or you're southwest. You had to be directly that way, directly that way. Three tribes directly that way. It was directly across. That's what this warlock is seeing when he looks from on high. And what does he say in verse 8? Who shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Again, Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who can condemn us? It is God who justifies us. And what he sees is so deep that he says in verse 10, let me die the death of the righteous. Let my last end be like his. Now here's the thing. Balaam is going to walk away and still be unchanged. And here's a quick lesson about Balaam. Balaam never gives his life to God. He makes the mistake of even though he saw divine light, he never walked in divine life. Even though he preached truth, he never practiced truth. Even though he had a public exposition of truth, he never had a personal experience with truth. This is an example of someone who's so close yet so far. Well, basically, Balak hears him pronounce this blessing, and he's like, what are you doing? He takes him to a different mountain, thinking that there's another place where the power of God won't work as well, right? So he takes him to yet another place. And look at this. In Numbers 23, verse 19, Balaam opens his mouth again. And he says in verse, let's look at verse 20. Behold, I've received commandment to bless, and he has blessed. I cannot reverse it. He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Look at, as he's looking down at the Israelites, mind you, knucklehead folk, murmuring folk, people even talking about going back to Egypt, people saying, God brought us out here, he's going to leave us and we're going to die. People doubting God's love, but the fact is that they were God's people and they had applied the blood of the lamb to their doorposts. So even though they were sinful people, a fickle people, a group of weirdos at best at times, it's still God's people. Again, Romans 8, who can condemn us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And what does he say when he's looking down at them? And what is he seeing again? He's seeing them in the form of a cross. He says this, verse 20, or rather verse 21, he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. He is saying that the father sees his people through the blood of the lamb. Of course there's tons of iniquity in Jacob. There's tons of iniquity in me and you. Iniquity means crookedness within, right? 
But because the Father sees us through the blood, he sees us through the innocent substitute, the perfect sacrifice of his son, Balaam is looking down and he's prophesying. Again, this shows the sovereignty of God because God has now seized the most known Satanist warlock. And this man is not only saying blessings, he's saying some of the most powerful things concerning God and God's people in the entire Old Testament. And what does he say when he looks down at that sinful bunch? But because they're God's sinful bunch, because they're God's blood-washed sinful bunch, because they're now the children of God and the objects of God's sovereign love, he looks down and he says, what again? Would you please make sure this rocks you? He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Whoa. The judge of all the earth, who Habakkuk 1.13 says his eyes are so pure, he can't even look on iniquity. It says he has beheld no iniquity. He that made the eye, shall he not see it? He that made the ear, shall he not hear it? The one that knows everything, because they're God's people though, because they've applied the blood of the lamb, it says he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. Again, Romans 8, if God is for you, who could be against you? If God has justified you, who can condemn you? He says the Lord his God is with him and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. And look at this, verse 23. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. He's saying there is no curse. There is no voodoo. There is no spell. There is no spiritual wickedness that can work against God's people when they are in God's beloved arms. Neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it will be said of Jacob and of Israel, look what God has done. So now he takes him to another location, Numbers 24. And now Balaam is referring to himself as this. Look at Numbers 24, verse 3. I'm the man whose eyes God has opened. And he says this, verse 4, Numbers 24. I, Balaam, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance but having my eyes open, how beautiful are the tents of Jacob and your tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth as a garden by the river's edge, as the trees of line aloes which the Lord has planted, you're like cedar trees planted beside the waters." This is how, no matter what we're going through, no matter what pandemic we're in, no matter what's to come for the end of 2020, no matter what's to come in 2021, this is how God sees us. And it's so true that you take even the most demon-worshipping warlock, you take even the wickedest person, when even they are on high and God seizes them, they even have to confess how blessed we are. Do you have this kind of confidence? Now do you see why Paul said in Ephesians 3, I'm praying that you would know the love of Christ, know how loved you are so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. Now do you see why Paul said it's knowing this that is dictates how much you walk in the joy of the Lord, how much you walk in the confidence of being God's little boy, God's little girl, God's warrior, God's prayer warrior. No longer is it about, well, I'm not a prayer warrior because I don't feel like a warrior when I pray. No, I'm a prayer warrior because I believe in how amazing my Lord is and how much he loves me that even when I just sigh, he hears it. It's all about knowing who you are in him, who he is and his love for you. And like I shared, the believers who are going to make it in this day, the believers who are going to take a licking and keep on ticking, the believers who are going to get worn down but not worn out, the believers who are going to take a good shot but keep coming back, the believers who won't quit are going to be the believers that are regularly, radically revolutionized by the love of Christ. Where no matter what you fall into, no matter where your mind goes, no matter how self-righteous you become and prideful, or just no matter how worldly and backslidden, you know who you are and you rehearse, I am my beloved song of Solomon 710 and his desire is toward me. The goodness of God always brings you back. The goodness of God makes you give him all of your life. Romans 12, 1, in light of the mercies of God, in light of the goodness of God, in light of how wonderful he is, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. 
He continues in Numbers 24, verse 7, he will pour the water out of his buckets. He will pour his seed in the many waters. His king will be higher than Agag, and his kingdom will be exalted. Then he gives what is now, he moves from three declarations over God's people to one of the most powerful messianic prophecies. Now this warlock, God is showing how sovereign he is. This warlock is now going to utter one of the most powerful prophecies about the coming Messiah in all of the Bible. And he says this, Numbers 24, verse 17, I will see him, but not now. I will behold him, but not nigh. There will come a star, capital S, out of Jacob. A scepter, capital S, speaking of the reign of a king, will rise out of Israel. He will smite the corners of Moab, destroy all the children of Sheph. Out of Jacob, verse 19, will come he that will have dominion, and he will destroy him that remaineth of the city. Now do you see why when the wise men, the long lineage of soothsayers and, and, and fire worshipers, when they came, who did they refer to Jesus as? We've come and followed his star. This was now evangelistically spread. Who is sovereign no matter what the crisis? Who is sovereign no matter what curse? Who can curse God's church? Who can stop God's church? Who can stop God's people? Nothing, no one. So, yeah, we redid some points. God is sovereign. God loves you. God is for you. If God is for you, none can be against you. Two, God wants to use you mightily. Would you go to Numbers chapter 11? And this is going to be the second closing. Numbers 11. Numbers 11. Are you ready? Are you ready? I hope you're ready. And my prayer is just that this message would, would, would change you. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, that as we behold in a glass, it means a mirror, the glory of God, we are changed from glory to glory by his spirit. The word of God is likened to a mirror. And it says that when you look at this mirror correctly, that that word changes you. My prayer is that today we've been changed, not just enlightened, not just, oh, that was a neat story, but we've been changed. Something's changed. We're different. And that's what the journey's all about. In Numbers 11, and I got to wrap up now. In Numbers 11, this is before all of this happens with Balaam. Follow this now. In Numbers 11, Moses is worn out. Moses is dealing with two million people. And even though from heaven's vantage point, there is no iniquity in them, there is no perverseness in them, they are spotless by the blood of the lamb, there is no enchantment against them, on them still working out their own salvation, they were a headache. We're a headache. But the Lord loves us with an everlasting love. Moses says this in verse 14. I'm not able to bear this people alone. It's too much for me. You see that? Numbers 11, 14. The Lord said to Moses, okay, you're right. Gather 70 men out of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people. Get 70 people that have good reputations, right? Get the officers with them, bring them to the tabernacle, and let them stand there with you. He says, pick 70 people and let them stand right at the tabernacle with you, Moses. I will come down, verse 17, and I'm going to talk with you right in front of them. And look at this, underline it. I will take the spirit that's on you, Moses, and I will put it on those 70. Do you get it? Okay. And he says, so that you don't have to bear this alone. In Numbers 11, verse 23, rather... Verse 24, Moses went out, told the people the words of the Lord, gathered 70 men of all the elders, put them around the tabernacle. Just as God said, verse 25, the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him. The Lord took the spirit that was on Moses and gave it to the 70 elders. And when that spirit went on them, it says they began prophesying. No doubt they're prophesying, and we just think of prophecy as just future events, and that's a part of it, but it's also just revealing the mind and the heart of God. No doubt they're just speaking of God's glory. They're having just a deep experience in God's love, right? Because God is love, and they're prophesying. There's a supernatural phenomenon where you knew the Spirit fell on them. God has now taken the leadership from one man to 70 people with him, right? God is now going to use 70 people mightily, right? Let's keep going. Verse 26, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, 
The name of the other was Medad, and the spirit even rested on them. And they were of them that were written, but they didn't go to the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. Check it out. Seventy people were told, report to the tabernacle. Report to the tabernacle. The spirit's going to fall on you because God wants to use you mightily. Two didn't come. God pours the spirit on the 68 who came. Two stayed in bed. God even poured the spirit on them. So they're getting the same experience, even though they're home. Well, someone didn't like that. Verse 27, a young man came and told Moses. And he said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, meaning they're getting the benefits of being used mightily and they don't deserve it because they didn't come. Joshua really had a hard time with it. Joshua, verse 28, the son of Nun, the very Joshua who's going to lead the Israelites into the promised land, he said to Moses, my Lord, Moses, stop them now. Send a message to those two. Be quiet. Shut up. You don't deserve to be used mightily. You don't deserve it. Look at what Moses says to him. Verse 29, Moses says, do you envy them for my sake? Why are you envious of them being used mightily when they don't deserve it? And then look at what Moses says here. One of my favorite verses in the Pentateuch. Would to God that all the Lord's people would prophesy and that the Lord would put his spirit on everybody. He's saying, Joshua, you really don't understand this grace thing. You really don't understand grace. See, Moses killed a man in his prior career. Moses understood grace. He's saying to Joshua, you really don't get this grace thing because you think only the 68 who showed up should be used mightily and that the two lazy bones shouldn't get the benefit because they didn't show up. It's all grace. Are you envious of their experience because of me? He's like, if you th are you unhappy because you think I'm unhappy? See, Moses was a man after God's own heart. He says, I'm not unhappy at this. He says, if God could have his way, all of his people would prophesy like this and he would pour his spirit on everyone. He's saying if God could have his way, everybody right now would be getting filled with the spirit. It's just a matter of do we want it or not. You know what's amazing is Eldad and Medad, guess what? They may have been lazy bones. Guess what? They may have really missed out and chose to stay home, no doubt. Tempting God, no doubt. But guess what? Eldad means whom God loves, and me dad means love. Yeah, they might have been some lazy bones. They might have missed out, but they're still loved, and they're still whom God loves. The Lord loves us. The Lord wants to use us mightily. And again, going back to Balaam, if God will use even a demon-worshiping warlock to say some of the most powerful things over God's people and concerning the Messiah to come, how much more so does God want to use you mightily? How much more so does God want to pour his spirit on you right now? Do you know there is no Bible too dusty right now where God can't begin to speak deliverance to you from that Bible in a way like you have never seen? There is no backslider too far gone to where the Lord cannot bring you back today and set you on fire. There is no bondage you are dealing with. There is nothing you are struggling with where they could separate you from his love. God is sovereign. God is for you. God wants to use you mightily, but you've got to know this love. And I tell you what, you're going to have to figure out three points of your own from all that good stuff. We're blessed. We're a blessed people. And the key to making it in this day is knowing who you are before God, knowing your identity, celebrating your identity. Don't be like a Balaam. Again, Balaam won't be in glory because he mistook receiving divine light for having divine life. He mistook publicly expositing truth for personally experiencing truth. He was never a saved man, never a changed man. So God is sovereign. It says in Proverbs that the king's heart is in the hand of God. He could take any ruler's heart and turn it any way he wants. He did that with Balaam. Any ruler today, God controls everything. He's not the author of evil. He's not the author of sin. But Psalm 76, 10, he could take even the wrath of man and bend it so that it ends up working for God's supreme purpose. God is sovereign. A virus cannot live if he doesn't say so. A bird can't fall to the ground if he doesn't say so. And the sovereign one loves us. We are the apple of his eye. 
Let's make sure we're seeing things from on high, not from down low with the newspaper in front of you, not from down low with the computer screen telling you what to think, what to feel, how to be afraid, what level of fear you should be walking in. Scripture says God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Let's look at things from on high. Every time we get in the word, every time we pray, we're looking at things from on high. Your struggles, what you're dealing with, Anyone can call a struggle a struggle, but do you look at it from where the Lord sees it? He says, I've beheld no iniquity. When that warlock gets up on the mountaintop, what does he see? He sees a cross. He sees God's people in a cross. The Lord, he says, a star will come, a king will come, and he's looking at the very cross, the symbol of what that king would be nailed to so we could be saved. Listen, I'm about to preach again. I got to stop. Father, thank you so much just for your love for us. Thank you so much for the scriptures. Thank you so much for your spirit working through your word, speaking to us, your needy, thirsty people in a dry and weary land. Lord, we repent of not celebrating your sovereignty. We repent of not celebrating your love. We repent of not wanting to be used mightily when meanwhile Moses would say by your spirit, if God could have his way, everybody would be filled with the Spirit. Everybody would be prophesying. Everybody would be rising above this culture. Everybody would be walking as more than a conqueror. Lord, would you continue to make us restless with the things of the world until we're resting in your promises? Will you continue to make us restless with the things of this world until we're resting in these promises? We truly do love you because you loved us first. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.